cosmic acceleration. How supernova explosions trace the history of the universe. Robert Kirshner, Harvard University. I remember seeing people on the wall on my TV when I watched the news about Berlin in 1989. Reunification of Germany always seemed a remote possibility, but I had no idea it would happen so soon and vividly. In fact, I don't even recognize my own voice. My goal uh, this afternoon is to tell you about 14 billion years of cosmic history in 14 minutes. To do this, I have to leave out a number of things. Most history, for example, kings, wars, the work of other people. I will uh, try, however, to convey the story of how we know that the universe is accelerating and how we infer the existence of the dark matter and the dark energy you just heard about. If I could see the slide. Oh, if I could push the button, I suppose. There we go. So what I want to do today is to show you that uh, using supernovae, which are exploding stars, we can measure the distances to galaxies. Here's a system of 100 billion stars like the sun. And we can measure those over uh, a large span of cosmic distance, and from that, figure out what the history of cosmic expansion has been. We've known since the 1930s that the universe is expanding. What I want to show you is that the universe is expanding faster now than it was in the past. All right, now I push this. All right. So we know where we are in the universe, but not very well. Most of us couldn't write down too much of our cosmic address. We know we're on the Earth, and we know that's not the center of the universe. We know that we're orbiting the sun, and what I'm telling you now is that the sun is not at the center of our own Milky Way galaxy. This, of course, is not a picture of the Milky Way galaxy. We are not able to get outside and take a picture of ourselves. Nevertheless, Berlin, the Earth, the Sun are far from the center of our own galaxy. The Milky Way has an extent of about 100,000 light years. Astronomers like to use this method of talking about distances. In the United States, we have a very convenient uh, distance measuring unit. We call it the foot. It's used in the United States and in Myanmar, I believe. And it corresponds to the distance that light can travel in one nanosecond, a billionth of a second. So you never see the world the way it is when you get information that comes to you by way of light. I'm looking at the people in the front row, and I see them the way they were eight nanoseconds ago. Curiously, the people in the back look younger. <laughs> and that is because I don't see them as they are. I see them as they were a hundred nanoseconds ago. Okay. It's just silly in the room, but in the universe, this is not silly. This is, in fact, how astronomers use a telescope as a no-nonsense time machine to see the light from the past, to see what the universe was like in the past, and as I'll show you, to trace the history of cosmic expansion. All right. We can't take a picture of our own Milky Way galaxy like the one that I just showed you because we're in it. It's like a pepperoni in a pizza. You can't take a picture of the whole pizza when you're in the crust. <laughs> this is a picture of our Milky Way galaxy. We see it edge on. You see it across the northern sky uh, in the summer. And uh, the most interesting thing in this picture is quite inconspicuous. It's another galaxy over here. And in 1900, people did not understand that those other fuzzy little patches, the nebulae, or as we call them today, the galaxies, are equivalent to the Milky Way. So let me tell you a little bit about that story. Here we have a local scientist from Dahlem who was having his photograph uh, taken uh, with a standard photographic camera. And you can see that during the time he was, uh, during the time the shutter was open, this person disagrees with Einstein. This person actually left the room. <laughs> I 
Einstein had it. Well, the great thing now about technology is that you can uh, find out what people were thinking. And what Einstein was thinking at that time is the thing that astronomers told him was true, that the universe was static, not expanding or contracting. As far as they knew, the Milky Way was the entire universe. And so Einstein, who had just written down the equations of general relativity, that's the equations for gravity, and applied them to the universe as a whole, found that he could make a special solution that was static by putting in, by hand, an extra term, the so-called cosmological term, or the cosmological constant. So he did that, and uh, was very pleased with the result. It was a static universe that, as far as he knew, agreed with the astronomical observations. But that picture was disrupted very soon by observations using the telescopes of the time. This is the 100-inch telescope. Oh, that's another unit we have that's very, very useful. The 100-inch a uh, telescope at uh, Mount Wilson, up above the little village of Los Angeles, California. Uh, and this was the leading telescope of the time. Again, the most important thing in the picture is very inconspicuous. It's the place where the human being sits to operate the telescope. And here's the human being, Edwin Hubble, sitting on that bentwood chair, operating the 100-inch telescope. And what he was doing was observing a certain kind of star whose brightness he knew and measuring how bright it appeared by comparing a star by observing a star whose brightness you know with its apparent brightness you can figure out how far away it is if you look out you know over the i don't know say at the seashore you see the lights of ships you know they're dimmer when the ship is far away and if they were all the same intrinsic brightness, if they were all 100 watt bulbs, you would be able to figure out the distance to ships by the, uh, by the brightness uh, that the uh, light appeared. Well, it's the same technique that Hubble used, and he used it to look at uh, objects, he looked, used it to look at the nebula, the Andromeda Nebula, the one that I showed the little circle of, and he found that the distances, instead of being like the size of the Milky Way, 100,000 light years, were 10 times bigger, a million light years. And that means that the galaxies, these fuzzy little things, are not part of the Milky Way. They are equivalent to the Milky Way, but far away. So if you imagine a dinner plate and a big table, it would be something like 10 times the diameter of the dinner, of the dinner plate would be the distance between these objects. So it's galaxies all the way out. It's only a million light years to the nearby ones, uh, but the more distant ones, and the ones that I'll be talking about, are several billion light years away that allow us to trace a long fraction of the history of cosmic expansion by direct observation. So Einstein had put this cosmological constant, denoted by the Greek letter lambda, into his equations but once the universe was known to be expanding, he realized this was not such a good idea, and he banished this cosmological constant. He said, let's get rid of it, let's not discuss it anymore. But what I'm here today to tell you is that modern observations show that there is some anti-gravity, some springy quality to the universe pushing back against the attractive force, and that we need something very much like the cosmological constant, or something that m resists gravity and pushes back that creates the acceleration that we see. So we'll come back to this idea. Now, the explosions, the stars that I'm going to talk about are exploding stars that blast themselves apart and shine as brightly as four billion stars like the sun, but only for a month or so. There have been those explosions in our own Milky Way, but they are very rare, typically one per century or so. There hasn't been one in, the, in our century that we've seen. But here's the uh, location of a supernova that was, went off in 1572 that Tycho Brahe saw uh, in November, in fact, of 1572. And when we go to that place now, what we see are the shredded remains of that star. When we use the supernova, these bright objects, it turns out that with appropriate adjustments that we've worked on quite hard, the supernovae are the same brightness. And 
you can use them as very accurate tools to measure the distances. So here I show you the, the thing that Hubble found, which is that the there is a relation between distance and velocity. We can measure the distances to objects, and we can also take the light from them, spread it out into a spectrum, and from the shift of the spectrum lines, either to the red or to the blue, we can tell whether it's going away from us or toward us. And what Hubble found, and what this diagram shows even better, is that uh, as you look at more and more distant objects, so this distance is in astronomers' secret units. This is about uh, 2 billion light years out to the edge of this diagram. And this, uh, as you go to bigger distances, the objects that you see are moving away from you faster, faster. Uh, so here are the fastest ones on this diagram are moving about one-tenth of the speed of light. The universe is stretching apart in all directions. This is what Hubble showed. This is what we call Hubble's law. But what I want to show you is that by looking way in the back of the room, by looking at very large distances, we can compare, which is out beyond the edge of this diagram, we can compare the uh, expansion rate back then with the expansion rate now. And we can find out, not by argument or philosophical considerations, whether the universe is speeding up or, or slowing down. So let me go on to that. To do that, of course, you need to find those distant supernovae. And here I show you one of the telescopes in the Southern Hemisphere that we used. This is the, our own Milky Way over here and the clouds of Magellan that you can see in the Southern Hemisphere. And with a large uh, digital camera, it's possible to photograph many galaxies at once. So even though supernovae are very rare, one in a century per galaxy, if you look at enough galaxies, then you can find a supernova tonight. The problem, and it turns out you need to look at about 10,000, you need to look at about 10,000 galaxies. And you can get a graduate student to work on that. <laughs> but they won't work on it for very long. What they prefer to do is to write a computer program that will do that uh, for you so that you can find the supernova in the distant galaxy. So here's a nearby galaxy with a supernova. And the goal, of course, is to look at these very distant galaxies and find a little dot next to one of these that represents an exploding star whose distance we can measure. Well, uh, here's how it works in, when you implement this. This shows a picture that might be taken tonight. This would be about 1 1,000th of the image area for the camera. So this is just a little snippet of the, uh, of the sky. And here's a picture that might have been taken a month ago, let's say. These supernovae take a few weeks to get bright and dim again. So uh, the idea is you register these pictures and subtract them. And if you've done a good job, then the things that don't change, like this spiral galaxy, disappear because they're the same in both pictures. And the only thing that's left is the thing that uh, was new in this picture from tonight. When you subtract the old picture, there's something left over, and it even has a red circle around it, so you know it's real. <laughs> so that's a supernova in that distant galaxy. So the idea is you look at the distant galaxies, you look at the nearby ones, you measure their distances from the brightness of the <coughs> supernova. <coughs> Gesundheit. And you measure the velocity from the stretch in the spectrum. And what we found was this surprising result. You can see that Einstein is surprised that the universe was accelerating. Now, when we take this information together with information from the cosmic microwave background, that's the glow from the hot big bang, the ripples in that hot big bang, and information about how galaxies are clustered, we get this very strange pi diagram for the constituents of the universe. Atoms, those are the things we heard described of in a very highbrow way as made of quarks. These are made of neutrons and protons and electrons. These are the items of the periodic table. These are the things that you know and love. These are the things that we see around us. They include the galaxies. They include the stars. Only about 4% of the universe. Most of the gravitating matter is not atoms. It's something else. It might be particles of the type that will be discovered at the Large Hadron Collider, or clues to it. it might come from uh, the story that we develop 
for weakly interacting particles, but it's not the ordinary stuff. And this dark energy, this stuff that we just discovered 15 years ago, is three quarters of the universe. Now, I don't know how you feel about this diagram. Personally, I feel very special that I am made of atoms, you are too, uh, <laughs> and that our most important resource in science, which is ignorance, uh, is very plentiful. Most of what we have here is things that we don't know. We don't know what the dark energy is, we don't know what the dark matter is, and even though we try to measure it, the uh, fact is that we know how much there is, but we don't know what it's made of. So my own feeling is that uh, I feel quite proud to be made of baryons, and uh, the things that we know and love uh, are made of them too. I think that baryons are the most delicious part of the universe. Thank you very much.